The second goal that you have as a mold testing technician is to identify the boundary of fungal particulate spread. Very important. If you don't do this, there's no point doing any remediation because you don't know how far that fungi has gone from actual growth and spread throughout the rest of the building. And that, of course, is essential to determine the scope of remediation. Before we do that, just to recap on fungi, we have canidia or spores, another word for spores, hyphae, which are branching filaments that come from the spores. And canidia fours are considered to be specialised hyphae or reproductive structures. And um, mycelium, which is the branches of hyphae. So you can see this here. Canidia fours are basically hyphae or specialised uh, reproductive structures just before they become spores. Um, the spores come off when they're disturbed from a surface uh, into the air. They then settle onto a surface where 25% of spores can germinate, which means 75% of spores are not viable. This is why killing back, uh, fungi with biocides is ridiculous because 75% is already dead. As long as you inhale high levels of dead spores, it's still very toxic to you because they contain mycotoxins and contain um, other uh, proteins in their cell walls that can trigger an immune response. So the 25% that are viable sit on a surface and then what they do is they then start branching these filaments that infiltrate the substrate, whatever they're on, whether it's food or furnishings or gyprock or timber. Uh, and then they start creating these branching filaments to infiltrate into that surface and then eventually they release spores and the whole cycle starts again and again. When it comes to air sampling, what we're actually measuring is spores and hyphae. And that's important because we're able to determine that fungal particulate. The advantages of air sampling. Air sampling, is, air sampling and surface sampling is critical because um, without doing that, you don't know if there's a problem in the house. By the time you get to this stage, you have conducted an exposure history with the client. That's important because that can help you look, know where to look where there's issues with moisture and condensation and drainage problem, plumbing issues that the client has told you. They also will tell you the health problems. And if there's asthma, allergies or fatiguing syndrome, then you know you've got to look carefully because that's often associated with mould. Um, by the time you get to air and surface samples, you've done a thorough site inspection, you've done moisture mapping, to identify sources of moisture unique to the site and where moisture can come into the built environment and where it is inside the built environment. From that, you should be able to establish a sampling plan. You're not gonna sample willy-nilly because no one has an un unlimited budget. So the most important area you'll sample, of course, will be outside first, because that is your control. And at least every 10 samples you do, you should do another air sample for outside. The air sample outside needs to be at least five metres away from the house if you can. If it's a multi-storey apartment, it'll be on the balcony, even if it's close to the doors. Just make sure the doors to the inside of the balcony of the apartment are shut for as long as possible before you do the outdoor sample on the balcony. But ideally, it's five metres away because you don't want to be sampling what's coming from the house. You want to make sure there's no traffic going past, there's no buses, no lots of wind, preferably not raining if possible. Often, um, carport, can be useful if there's a, um, a, fa a uh, roof is ideal. However, you know, not near the ground, you'll never sample on the ground. That's why you have a tripod for about 1.2 metres. And to just make sure um, that it's, you know, the outside is, is such that it's a proper sample. Because if the outdoor sample isn't taken properly, all the other results, you really can't compare it to and that's gonna be a problem. So the advantages of air sampling, it's non-invasive, it's easy to do, it identifies a genre or type of fungi and identifies potential hidden mould. So when I take an air sample and I go, I can't see um, any mould or damp odour in that room, moisture mapping was unremarkable because I didn't pick up anything, the air sample came back high in the thousands of Aspergillus penicillium or Cladosporium or Ketomium, then I know there's something going on in the walls or the roof or the subfloor, which means you need to go back and do destructive testing in order to identify where that was. So in reality, to do your job properly, if you have high levels in this air samples, you really need to go back and do more testing and that's just the nature of the work. The limitations are it only provides a snapshot for that moment in time, it's not standardised and it, it can be influenced by carpet and paint. If the client has recently carpeted or painted that room, there's almost no point doing an air sample because there'll be virtually nothing on it. And this is because the paint 
and the new carpet acts as a static and it, it attracts the spores to the surface, which means that you're not going to get much on the air sample and I've found that time and time again. So you need to write that in a report. I've had to clear buildings um, and what they did is they replaced all of the floors with vinyl, it just stunk going to the house and they painted everything, which meant all my air samples were unremarkable and I stated in my report this needs to be tested within three months because I don't know if they actually got rid of the moisture laden materials and the gyp rock and the timber frame which I suggested they do because I couldn't see it and I wasn't there at the time that they conducted the mould remediation. So to cover my butt I stated that more testing needs to be done within three months um, to enable any actual growth that was present to you know be able to pick up those hyphae and spores. Indoor pathogenic fungi are your Aspergillus penicillium, Ketomium cladosporium, Stachybotrys are the most common that I'll find. Stachy not so often, but when you do find it, it's really bad because it's a sticky type. It's called sticky balls. It's a sticky type of mould and it's really toxic because all of those fungi are mycotoxin producers. So if they're seeing an integrative GP, it's a good idea to get urine testing to see if those mycotoxins for those fungi are found in the urine. Indoor fungi that produce mycotoxins, specifically are aspergillus, and there's different genre of aspergillus from aflatoxin, okratoxins, and stegromatocystin. That's the mycotoxins. And the type of aspergillus species that can do this are aliaceous, um, carbonarius, fumigatus. Of course, there's a lot of data on aspergillus fumigatus um, causing pneumonia in immunocompromised patients, especially in hospitals. So the only way you're going to identify mycotoxin producers in your testing is to do viable sampling. So remember with the viable sampling, we use a different cassette for the viable sample. Um, and that cassette gets sent to the lab and then they get the slide and put it onto culture to enable that fungi to grow. So that's a different one to the total spore cassette that we normally use. The other one, of course, is a ketomium fusarium, and I've just listed here the types of species of ketomium fusarium and penicillium and stachybotrys that produce mycotoxins. So as I said, the only time I'll do viable sampling is if I have a patient who's really sick with chronic inflammatory response where the doctor has referred them to me. I will do both total spores in, their, in the house and viable. I'll do the viable sampling in their bedroom or where the water damage is in that particular home and uh, do also total spores because remember viable sampling only picks up 25% because only 25% of spores are viable. Um, and the benefit of viable sampling is you'll pick up the genre and the species, whereas total spores only picks up the genre. It tells us it's aspergillus, but it doesn't tell us the type of aspergillus. It tells us the penicillium, but it doesn't tell us the type or species of penicillium. So if you're working with a doctor and they've tested mycotoxins in the patient's urine, you need to do viable sampling. And um, I would also do total spores in the same room. Okay, so air sampling exposure guidelines, which we've gone through. Uh, I like the Australian Mold Guidelines simply because they use the outdoor as the control and they don't actually give figures until they become high. Um, I think this is the best guidelines we have. There are many, many guidelines. Remember, none of these are legally enforceable. But the reason why I like it is because they have a set of guidelines for naturally ventilated buildings versus mechanically ventilated buildings. And why that's important is because in a mechanically ventilated building, you'll find that the HVAC system will filter out most of the spores from outside. Whereas in a naturally ventilated building, especially in a home like mine built in the 80s, it's quite drafty. So you'll find a lot of the spores you find outside, like basidia spores, asco spores, you'll find in higher levels inside. And that's not a problem, it's just is as it is. Um, with the Australian Mould Guidelines, the low levels are considered half the outdoor. I love that because what I don't like about some labs is they say if it's above a thousand spores per cubic meter, it's a problem. That's garbage because in, in um, autumn or fall, you'll find the levels of spores per cubic meter of air could be well above a thousand spores, which means the outdoor sample is already contaminated, which is rubbish. It's just a different time of year during a different microclimate when fungi are more prolific. So I think it's far better for us to use these guidelines because it compares it to the outdoor. Whatever you found in the outdoor, it should be less than in the indoor. So an ideal healthy home 
for mold will have the same type of spores inside as those found in the outdoor sample, but in lesser numbers. That's it, end of story. If it's elevated, it's um, you know, uh, up to a thousand spores or, you know, or higher, then that's a problem especially if there's speciation, especially if the type of fungi you find inside is different to what you're finding in the outdoor sample, that's a problem. Um, and especially if they're water damage molds, which we just mentioned, Aspergillus, Penicillium, Ketomium, Cladosporium, Stachybotrys. So here's an example of what you'll get from the lab for an air sample. And you can see here um, that the, here's the name, kitchen, boardroom, front office, Aspergillus uh, was 9,480 spores per cubic metre. In the outdoor sample, it was zero. So this is a huge problem. We've got a water problem. We've got a, water, we've got a problem here, Houston. And of course, Cladosporium was 240. It was nothing in the outdoor samples. And the total spores was 9,720 per cubic metre in the kitchen. And the hyphae was 27, whereas outdoors it was zero. That's a really big problem. On the air samples, you don't want to see speciation. You don't want to see any of the water damaged molds. You don't want to see high levels, in a, higher than the outdoor samples. And the high fee is really critical because it tells you if you're close to the actual growth. Um, in your report, you're going to get those mold lab results and then you're going to condense it so that the client can understand it. And it will look something like this. The outdoor sample, this is what you found, the type of species. Um, but on the indoor sample, you found Aspergillus penicillium, which you didn't find in the outdoor. You found Cladosporium in high levels, which you found in lower levels in the Cladosporium. So in the report, I would say that the Cladosporium in the living room was twice that from the outdoors and almost three times higher than the outdoor sample, and that's a problem. And the next thing we're going to look at is surface sampling summary. Surface samples really important. I mentioned you've got to do surface samples in order to determine how to remediate. If you find high levels of pathogenic fungi in the air sample, then surface sampling, coming back and surface sampling that room is important to know whether that, that needs to be HEPA sandwiched, which we'll talk about in remediation. So surface sampling identifies the type of fungi, the genre, Aspergillus, Penicillium, etc. establishes the condition, remember condition one to three, condition one is normal fungal ecology, condition two is high settled spores, condition three is visible mold and act actual growth. Um, and of course, very useful for um, testing air conditioning systems. Um, the limitations, it only covers, covers a tiny area, just a square inch. So you can only make judgments about that square inch. So you want to make sure, because it's $70, $80 per sample for the lab cost, that you do it, that you justify there's moisture there, there's visible mould, or there's signs of moisture to even justify doing that sample. As I said, very few people have an unlimited budget. Surface samples are also very important if you're in an empty building where no one's been there for more than a month. It means you're not going to find much on the air samples and you need to do more surface samples where the fungal particulate is likely to be. So here's an example of a surface sample using a biotape. Can't see it very well in the shade, but this biotape here is just picking up what's on that surface. Uh, in terms of the surface sample exposure guidelines, again, I like the Australian mold guidelines. Um, low is less than 50 spores. You can't compare it to outside, of course, with surface samples. Normal fungal ecology is up to 500. But the main thing is you don't want to see water damaged molds. Aspergillus, Penicillium, Cladosporium, Ketomium, Stachy. Um, so normal fungal ecology is up to 500. Anything up to 500 with speciations is a problem, i.e. that you've got those water damaged molds. Um, and if you have propagals like uh, high fee and high levels, you know there's actual growth. So in the mold guidelines, they say anything above 1,000 is a contaminated surface that needs remediation. And if it's extreme, it's over 5,000 with pathogenic fungi and high levels of canidia fours or high fee. Here's an example of a surface sample. You can see here in the showroom removed corners, they had 2,295 spores per centimetre squared. Notice the scientific notation. Because it's a surface sample, it's not per cubic metre of air, it's centimetre squared. Because you remember you took the biotape um, um, on that little surface. So here you've got, in this case, Stachybotrys in the showroom case was 49,280 uh, spores per centimetre squared. If, if I was in there, you'd want to be full um, Tyvek suit, 
full personal protective equipment and of course a full face respirator. That is incredibly toxic and that would make someone very sick, it possibly could be lethal. So you don't ever want to see anything like that on, on your slides and hopefully you were suited up when you're in that space. Um, you can see here 87,780 spores per centimetre squared on the ground living room sofa. I mean, this is such high levels of contamination that people in this environment were incredibly sick. Um, and that's why surface samples are important. Uh, dust sampling is the third type of sampling that we will talk about in the course. Uh, the advantage is it, it can identify the relative mouldiness of your house and the Environmental Relative Mouldy Index or ERMI is commonly used. Uh, another alternative which is a cheaper option is Hurts Me. But basically they're sampling the dust in the house. You can either do it with a Swiffer cloth but you need to be mindful where you take the sample, on the top of architraves, top of pictures, um, near the, at the back of the fridge, areas where people are unlikely to clean. Um, is important or I prefer the vacuuming sample but of course that's not always possible if they don't have rugs or, or carpets and with the vacuum sample you'll do it in one living space and one bedroom and then collect the sample of dust send it to the lab and they'll pick it up for up to 36 different species 26 pathogenic species water damage ones and 10 healthy ones set up a ratio and then give you an idea about that um, limitations, it's expensive, it's up to $400. It, the only time I think this is useful is if the client's doing a pre-inspection audit and can't afford a mould testing technician or building biologist to assess the house before they buy it. So they can do this themselves, send it to the lab. The only problem is a lot of the clients that, that do this don't do it properly and many times it's unremarkable and low and when I've gone in to assess the site the levels were extreme. So you need to know what you're doing with ERMI and a lot of people get false negatives. The other thing is it doesn't identify the source of moisture. So once you get an ERMI that's elevated, um, it doesn't tell you where the moisture was, what the moisture laden materials were, what the cause of the moisture was and how to develop a scope of remediation. So you still need to get a mould testing technician or building biologist to do a complete assessment of that building because all it's saying is there's a problem and we've got these type of species there but we don't know where or what or when. So with the dust sampling you can see here, oh, I won't go into the detail, we've done it already. This is the type of reports you'll get um, for for ERMI and you can see here you've got 26 different species here of water damage um, moulds and the, the benefit of, of ERMI again is you've got the genus and the species. So if you're picking up you know really toxic species that produce mycotoxins then that can be useful and then of course you've got 10 that are normally not associated with a water damage building and then they come up with a ratio which in this case is 4.9 uh, which is considered to be um, elevated. Patients with chronic inflammatory response or fatigue syndrome should not be in homes where the ERMI is above two and anything above five you definitely want a mold testing technician like yourself or a building biologist to assess the site. Hurts Me is also dust sampling but basically they're only assessing five moulds not 36. This is significantly cheaper however I don't generally do this simply because there can be other types of pathogenic moulds apart from these five that can cause serious adverse health effects like cladosporium. So it is limited but it is a cheaper. So what often people will do is they'll do an ERMI test and then after remediation do a Hertz me test because it's cheaper. Personally I think as testing technicians and building biologists we shouldn't be doing ERMI unless the client had an unlimited budget and said yep do ERMI in addition to all your air surface samples and inspection, fair enough. I've never come across that um, because I think it doesn't give us the most important information which is to identify the sources of moisture and moisture laden materials. In Hurts Me, if it's less than 11 it's considered to be statistically safe for re-entry for people with chronic fatigue syndrome. If it's 11 to 15 it's borderline if it's above 15 people with uh, fatigue syndrome shouldn't be in there.